Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the different parts of the brain that are important in motor control and learning motor functions. Okay, so motor control and learning. There are six areas throughout the brain that are mostly responsible for our normal motor function. Now I wanna point out that these are the six areas that are responsible for the most, but there are still more areas that if there are dysfunctions, we do see other motor dysfunctions and coordination and things like that. Um, so these are primarily responsible, but if we have different sensory dysfunctions or, or other problems, that is going to impair our ability to coordinate movement in some cases. All right, so starting with discussion of the cerebellum, uh, we already started talking about this in the previous video, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth here. Um, so the cerebellum is arguably the most important regulation of muscle tone and in coordination of movement. Um, so it also plays a role in timing and learning of motor actions. Uh, most important role is to compare the intended movements planned by the cerebrum with the movements that actually occur. So this is what we talked about a lot in the last video. Uh, calculates the difference between the plan and the actual and sends the difference to the cerebrum so it can make corrections. Okay, so the cerebrum is making these motor plans that are going out to the body to tell the muscles how to contract, how much force to produce, and what direction the force should be produced, um, how much force, which muscles should activate. So it's creating these complex plans for how the body should move. It's sending those plans out to the body to tell it what to do. And a copy of those plans are going also to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is receiving sensory information from the body, from all around the, the body, that's bringing that sensory information back to the cerebellum and other parts of the brain at the same time to tell what is actually happening. So how heavy was the milk carton when you picked it up? Or how much friction did your shoe have with the ground when you took your next step? Um, so it's giving information about our position in space, how much uh, flexion or extension or abduction or whatever of our different joints, um, and how are we interacting with the world around us. So it's sending all that sensory information back to the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is comparing what the plan was coming from the cerebrum with what is actually happening out in the periphery. So we're looking at what was the plan and what is the actual, and the cerebellum is calculating the difference between the two. So it's doing that calculation and then it's sending that difference back to the cerebrum so that the motor areas in the cerebrum can correct the plan and make up for the difference that was detected by the cerebellum. It can make up for that difference and send out a modified plan back out to those same effectors, back out to the same um, skeletal muscles um, to change the plan so that we can account for the fact that the milk carton was full instead of empty like we might have anticipated or that we stepped on ice instead of solid ground like we had originally anticipated. Uh, so the cerebellum is receiving sensory input from many different places. That includes the proprioceptors and touch receptors throughout the body. Uh, so Golgi tendon organs, muscle spindle cells, joint kinesthetic receptors, uh, and then touch receptors throughout the body and uh, the skin and, and deeper levels than just the skin. And um, then it's also getting input from receptors of our special senses. So that includes like vision, hearing, and equilibrium. So the cerebellum is taking in all of this information uh, from the body about where we are in space and how we're moving. And then also from our special senses, which maybe we see the ice on the ground before we've stepped on it. So that would be important visual information for the cerebellum to consider so that it can anticipate um, what kind of changes we'll need to make. Uh, so it's receiving a copy of the motor plan generated by the cerebral cortex that was also sent to the muscles and it helps determine the corrections that we need to make so that we can have smooth, coordinated, accurate movement. Uh, the cerebellum is also important in timing muscle contractions to aim at a target, uh, perform a complex sequential action, or execute actions to a rhythm. So the cerebellum is important, like if you're going to clap to the beat, you know, or dance to the beat. So that, that sort of rhythmic movement 
Um, the cerebellum is very important for that. Uh, performing complex sequential action. So that could be something as simple as like, pick up the coffee carafe and pour it accurately into your coffee cup. That's a complex sequential action uh, where we need to aim to grab the handle accurately. We need to use the correct amount of force so that we're able to lift the coffee pot depending on how full or empty it is. Like if we use too much force, we might pick it up too quickly and splash coffee everywhere. If we use not enough force, we might not be able to lift it at all. Um, so we need to be able to generate the right amount of force in the right direction to be able to accurately lift up the cup and then to carefully pour it into the coffee target, the cup target, um, so that we're not spilling it everywhere, pouring it too quickly, and not pouring quickly enough, and then it doesn't really come out. Um, so that's actually a very surprisingly complex sequential action. Uh, so the cerebellum is critical in being able to do things like that, um, where we're aiming for a target, we're doing something complex where one step has to come after the next, where each step has to be very, very precise. Um, and then also where there's a rhythm. The cerebellum learns to anticipate sensory feedback before the movement is even complete. And that increases the speed and efficiency of its difference calculations. So the cerebellum is learning, when, like when we learn a new skill or like if we're learning a new sport and maybe you're learning how to do a tennis serve, for example, that's another complex sequential action where you need to start in the correct position, you need to throw the ball to the correct height, you need to start with your other hand in your other arm in the correct position at the correct angle with all the joints in the right position. You know, so and so on. You know, I can go on and on with that action and with many others. So, once we're doing a task repetitively, so like if you're doing a tennis serve again and again and again because you're trying to improve your your tennis serve and you're trying to, um, you're you're learning the behavior and you're trying to improve your accuracy and and improve the form. You know, maybe you have a coach instructing you on. Um, you know, maybe you dropped your elbow and you need to lift your elbow. So you're learning how to do that action. And as you're practicing it, the cerebellum is remembering. The cerebellum is learning that action. And as you learn it, it, be, it gets better and better at anticipating the sensory feedback it's going to receive before it actually receives it. So when you've done that tennis serve a thousand times, then your cerebellum is going to start to anticipate, like if you already know you didn't throw the ball quite high enough, the cerebellum, because of the visual information, your cerebellum is already going to realize that, um, and maybe you let the ball fall and start again, uh, just as a little example. Okay, so you're going to start to anticipate sensory feedback which is going to allow the cerebellum to send its corrections to the cerebrum faster than when you were still learning it and had to wait for that sensory feedback to get to the cerebellum before it could send the corrections. So cerebellar impairment, if we have a damaged cerebellum, uh, would cause abnormally low muscle tone, uncoordinated or erratic movements, difficulty walking heel to toe, uh, coordination difficulties, and slurred speech. <coughs> now, speech is a motor function. Speech is the motor function of how the lips and tongue and mouth are moving to create uh, words, to communicate. So speech is a motor function, and if we lose our ability to smooth and coordinate our motor function, we lose the ability or have an impaired ability to coordinate the muscles and the movement of the lips and tongue, and so then that's where we get slurred speech. Now, alcohol significantly affects the function of the cerebellum, and so that's why the effects of alcohol uh, really are the same as the effects of a damaged cerebellum. It's just that they're temporary because as the body clears that alcohol from the system, the normal function of the cerebellum re returns. Um, but when someone is intoxicated, 
uh, they would have this same list of effects on the cerebellum. So it's one of the areas of the brain that is most affected by alcohol. Okay, on to our second part of the brain that's important in our motor control uh, called the basal nuclei, which you also may know as the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia, that's a term that is a bit older and the more updated term is the basal nuclei. That's because a ganglion, singular, is a collection of cell bodies, neuronal cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so we have like sensory ganglia, for example, those are the, the it's like a small collection of the neuronal cell bodies that would be on uh, the dorsal root of uh, the spinal nerves. Okay, so a ganglion is in the peripheral nervous system. A nucleus is the equivalent in the central nervous system. That's a collection of neuronal cell bodies in the central nervous system. So because we're talking about a collection of cell bodies in the brain, the more correct term here is nucleus. So basal ganglia, although that's a commonly used term, is less anatomically correct because they are actually nuclei rather than ganglia. But you'll hear either term used, you know, they're used interchangeably, um, but I prefer personally basal nuclei because it's the more updated anatomically correct term. Uh, so the basal nuclei are, it is a collection of nuclei in the cerebrum, midbrain, and diencephalon. So these are different nuclei that are scattered kind of throughout. And so in the picture here, we're seeing many of them. Uh, so collectively, they contribute to the control of motor actions. That's why we're discussing them here. Um, when we have dysfunction of different basal nuclei, we might have tremor, rigidity, tics, uh, difficulty performing motor sequences, impairment of intellectual capacity, uh, difficulty learning and maintaining new skills. Um, so basal nuclei might help to activate or retrieve movement plans, and it also helps to scale the amplitude of movements. So when we say scale the amplitude of movements, it's like, you know, if I do a small wave or really big wave, okay, so that's the same movement scaled to be smaller or larger. Uh, and that actually is extremely important when it comes to something like pouring the coffee in the cup. We want to scale that movement precisely so that we don't splash and pour it everywhere and so that we are able to actually pour it and it, it doesn't just stay in the craft that we're trying to pour it from. Uh, so there are lots of different nuclei that are part of the basal nuclei that have different functions and contribute in different ways. Um, and so when we look at the dysfunction of the basal nuclei, this is a, a pretty varied list, and I'm sure we could add more even to this list. And it's because it depends on which nucleus is affected, and is it affected in the way that it's overactive or that it's underactive. Um, so there are lots of different disorders that are caused by problems with the basal nuclei that would include like Parkinson's, uh, Tourette's, um, Huntington's disease, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and many more. Those are just some examples. So there are a variety of different dysfunctions that can occur depending on which nucleus is the problem and is it overacting or underacting. Okay, the primary motor cortex is another important area. Um, in this picture, it's that dark green strip down in the middle. Uh, that's the precentral gyrus, meaning the gyrus that is just before or just anterior to the central sulcus. So that's where the primary motor cortex is. It's the area of the cerebrum that is primarily responsible for controlling the force and direction of muscle activity. So it is primarily responsible for generating the motor plan that is going to go out to tell the body or the muscles of the body how much force to produce and in what relationship to others so that we have the right um, force vector essentially of all of the muscles that are acting on a joint. We want the right resultant force vector because that resultant force vector is what is going to cause movement in that direction. Uh, so the primary motor cortex primarily projects to the distal musculature, so mostly out to the limbs, and receives sensory feedback from the muscles to which it sends signals. 
Okay, the premotor cortex we see in the picture here, uh, it's anterior or before uh, the primary motor cortex. So it's another area of the cerebrum, plays a role in voluntary movements that depend on sensory stimuli, especially vision. So it's especially important in um, our physical motor response to sensory stimulation. So like when you visually see something, like if you see something coming at you, we will reflexively duck out of the way or you know catch the ball or whatever it is. We reflexively have a voluntary motor response to the thing that we see. Um, and so the premotor cortex is largely responsible for that. It also plays a role in preparing the body for forthcoming movements. Uh, so it activates a lot of our stabilizing and postural muscles. Um, so like if the primary motor cortex it might be acting on the more distal musculature, like in the limbs, and at the same time, the premotor cortex is going to act on the more proximal musculature that's going to help maintain the posture or the position of the body so that we can engage in the the plan that the primary motor cortex is coming up with. Then we have the supplementary motor area. That's another area of the cerebrum and plays a role in planning voluntary movements as opposed to movements that are provoked by sensory stimuli. Okay, so whereas the premotor cortex, a lot of its action is in response to uh, sensory stimuli, the supplementary motor area is not in response to sensory stimuli. Uh, it's involved in high level planning and production of complex movement and receives input from the basal ganglia. So it's responsible for a lot more of the higher level planning of action. So like when I'm trying to learn my uh, tennis serve, like the example I gave earlier, uh, the supplementary motor area is going to contribute a lot in trying to plan and coordinate this much more complex action. Then the parietal cortex uh, has lots of different areas throughout that lobe, uh, or both lobes, I should say, uh, that contribute important spatial information for an action. Um, so some areas of the parietal cortex are important for spatial attention and help produce spatially relevant behavioral intentions. So some actions are not very spatially important. So like if I'm gonna wave, that's not very spatially important. I don't have to do it in a very precise direction or um, in a very precise plane. Like I can wave all sorts of different ways in the space in front of me. And spatially, it's not very important unless I'm in danger of like whacking a cup of coffee off the table or something like that. So not very spatially relevant, but others are very spatially relevant, like my example of pouring the coffee into the cup. So in that case, extremely spatially relevant, because if I miss by a little, I'm gonna pour coffee all over the table. Or hammering a nail, very spatially relevant, because if you're not hitting the precise target, you're not gonna hammer the nail in. Uh, so damage to this area would make it difficult to complete sequences of event to events to perform a behavior like making a cup of coffee or hammering a nail. Okay, so it's important in sequencing, and it's important in spatial awareness of where you're completing that action in space. Okay, that is all I have for you here. Thanks for watching.